Welcome back to HuffPost Live. We're here at the World Economic Forum here in Davos, Switzerland, uh, and I'm so thrilled to be joined by Richard Lesser, of course, President and CEO of the Boston Consulting Group, and Wendy Woods. Um, you are also a senior partner and managing director of the Boston office, is that correct? Or Close. Close. <laughs> I am in the Boston office, but I'm actually responsible for all the social sector work that BPG does. Uh, fantastic. So globally, I lead all of global that. Global leading. Okay, that's what I thought, but then I saw the title, right. and you know, sometimes you read <laughs> titles here at these conferences, and they confuse you. <laughs> um, but we're here at Davos. Um, I know, of course, Richard, you've been coming for some time. This is our first time Absolutely. at WEF. What's kind of your read on what's really different and exciting to you this year? So I think in general, the connections that happen at Davos are always interesting and you learn and you get a feel for the world. I think we've been really excited, frankly, to have Wendy here and the involvement in what's going on in the, in the social sector and social impact work and specifically around social businesses. Uh, we had a chance to meet Professor Eunice yesterday and the work we've been doing with him and he is just so spectacular. Yeah. And, and so I think for us, mm -hmm. this has been a new, a new way for us to be a part of Davos and a really rewarding one actually. I'm so glad you brought Professor Yunus up. I had the pleasure of speaking with him yesterday, and he's been really trying to you know, drive this message of sustainability and how not everything can be profit-driven, and that can't be the bottom line. You know, He said there's much more to life, and I, I found it very uh, inspiring how he wanted to approach some of these solutions that people are trying to address through collaborations. And I know that you work on what you call social impact, uh, a term that was new to me, um, but within the global health realm especially, could you just share with us what that actually means and, and what you do? Sure. We call it social impact. What it really is is all of our work in the social sector. Okay. So health, education, environment, those types of topics, mm -hmm. development topics, mm -hmm. right? Um, in global health, what that means is we're getting engaged to actually improve the health of the people across the developing world working on things like malaria, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, with folk like your last guest, with Rollback Malaria, the Global Partnership. Helping to foster those collaborations. Mm -hmm. Again, Davos being a great place where you're bringing mm -hmm. the social sector, the public sector, right. the private sector together. Right. Because when we actually deal with some of those hardest problems of our time, no sector individually mm -hmm. can even begin to approach. So you work with foundations, as mm -hmm. you were saying, public-private partnerships, uh, as well as multilateral organizations. I mean, it seems to me that there's more funding in global health now than ever before. Uh, at least in recent years, it seems that that's the trend, and yet there's still some pretty significant challenges. I've been talking to you know, a vast array of people, doctors, people who are working from the business sector, and everyone seems to say that sometimes it's something as simple as distribution or just you know, human resource uh, being lacking. Yeah. What do you think is the major challenge, but where do you think we can actually make progress? Yeah. So you're absolutely right. I mean, to stick with the malaria example for a minute, yeah. funding in malaria has gone up 10x in the last 10 years. Okay. Phenomenal increase, right? Mm -hmm. And that has reduced malaria deaths by almost 50%. Mm -hmm. So we are making progress. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. The, the human capital constraints and the, the people resource constraints around this, mm -hmm. as well as the need for new technologies, mm -hmm. right? We can solve a lot of the world's problems right now, um, but there's a lot more tools that we need and we actually need more participation. Mm -hmm. um, again, one of the exciting things about Davos, um, when you talk about supply chains, right, the issues around food security and nutrition, mm -hmm. a lot of the work we do is the supply chain and re-envisioning the supply chains so that you actually maintain the integrity of that and get the food to the people that it's intended for, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there's been a lot of collaboration here. The nutrition and the food security conversations are actually, they're fantastic because it's not just the nutrition people having the conversation, right. they're having it with the agriculture people who actually talk about the diversity which, of agriculture, which makes right. a big difference. And it's the water and sanitation people, which actually means kids can keep the nutrients in, right? right. So. It's, and you have to think long term, obviously, when you're trying to address any problem. I, I, I want to kind of shift gears a little bit because there was something that you said recently, Richard, that really struck me. You said that you have a deep belief uh, at BCG that competitive advantage is not about adopting best practices or following what others do, but in being unique and differentiated, knowing where you stand out. And so many of the conversations here are about entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship, encouraging that at a younger age. So I, I feel like there's a correlation there. What do you mean by this, especially just knowing where you stand out? It sounds simple, but why take that approach? I, well, first, I want to say two very important things. The first is, in general, for businesses and, mm -hmm. and for social services, but particularly in business, the world is so competitive. And it's so easy to get caught up in a world where you're just trying to emulate the person down the street. And yet, if you look at the businesses that succeed over the long term, 
they don't win that way. They win by being a step ahead. They win by understanding customer needs before others, mm -hmm. by leveraging technologies before others. And the biggest challenge for a business leader is not to just caught up, get caught up in a game of just trying to learn what others do, but trying to understand your markets better, your opportunities better. Mm -hmm. But then you come to this world, and we look at the social business environment as not just emulating business, the same thing, mm -hmm. but about trying to be innovative in this context. So Wendy had some wonderful stories, maybe she'll share a few, but, but if you look at how networking, partnering, adaptiveness have evolved among these social businesses who are often more constrained for resources, right. facing immense tasks that no one organization can do alone, and how they push it forward. I actually think they're not only innovating to make themselves differentiated in higher impact. They're doing things that will ultimately flow back into the business world as well because it's the challenge of the world right now. And, and how do you measure impact? I mean, I don't want to like harp on this too much, but there's so much conversation and not to suggest that talk is cheap by any means, but a lot of people who I've been speaking to here are saying, look, talk is great, but we want more action. So once you act, how do you even then measure whether you're doing the right thing and whether you're actually effective? Well, you can. Hard, yeah. but you can, and the social sector has actually been getting better and paying a lot more attention. I think that is one of the learnings mm -hmm. from the business sector that's been translating in a really important way. Right. And we've been doing actually work with some of our clients on social return on investment, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What is the impact? And you can measure the impact of the programs. Right. We're doing work helping disadvantaged youth get into jobs, and you measure what's the placement rate, what's right. the retention rate. Right? I mean, you it can seem, put metrics around these. It seems to me it's so critical because, you know, corporate social responsibility yeah. and all these buzzwords are great, but you don't want to be throwing money away or, or throwing money at a problem yeah. without a kind of sustained effort. You know, this is one thing Professor Yunus talks about, sustainability. Yeah. Uh, with all that in mind, uh, I want to also talk about what it means to be successful, how you measure your own personal success, yeah. obviously a topic that's very important at the Huffington Post, as you know. Um, but there was this study that came out, um, uh, published by Edelman, uh, that said faith in governments fell to 44% from 48% in 2013, from, uh, according to the 2014 study. Trust in businesses, however, held steady at about 58%. Now that brings it to kind of a lead over government. I think the, the margin there is about 14, um, or no, I, well, this is revealing how horrible my math is. Let's just say that, <laughs> that it's better, but it's the widest that it's been in 14 years since they've yes. been doing the poll. And I found it really compelling with all these news stories about, you know, the NSA and what have you, um, you know, on the kind of agenda, in terms, uh, not an agenda, but kind of, you know, the media, that's what they're talking about. What do you think that actually reflects? Because people are suggesting that business can be more effective and more quick at addressing some of these problems that are on the agenda here at Davos. I mean, do you think it's a reflection of that? So first, let's be clear, 58% is not the aspiration, of right? Course. It is higher right now, but businesses have a lot of work too to continue to build trust and credibility. And there's been some progress made, but not enough. And I think that the gap reflects people want authenticity, they want action and results, and they want actions to match words. Right. And I think if you look around the world, in many cases, people have become frustrated with governments not being able to deliver the results to help people better their lives and improve. And often a gap between the words that people will express and the actions that they see taking. And businesses, I think, have started, many businesses, not perfect, but many, yeah. to recognize that gap and to try to be clear about what they stand for, right. what do they mean for their customers, their employees, their communities, and to try to live up to that. And obviously technology's uh, playing into this because you know, people can now actually hold businesses and leaders uh, to account in a way that they never right. could before. Absolutely. Now, whether you want to call it shaming or not, you have to be held accountable. And I'm just curious, you know, your thoughts on where this trend in technology and disruption and everyone having a voice is leading, uh, within the consulting world, a lot of people say that it's a very critical, critical time in the consulting world, uh, that, that more companies are willing to kind of do their own stra strategizing, if you will. Uh, are you concerned at all about that? What are your thoughts on that, Richard? So our clients have been building their own internal capabilities for decades, and they will continue to. And the bar for us keeps rising. Actually, we're actually quite optimistic because we think the two things that we're about, one is helping clients get to better insights of how they build their businesses, and the second is working in partnership with them to make change happen and have impact. 
the world's getting more challenging, more global, more right. complex, right. faster moving, and so we can make a difference. But part of our job is to help them build their internal capabilities. Yeah. If we're working on the same thing for a client for many years in a row, like we probably didn't do everything we could to help them build. So we see part of our job to help them get better, but of course the world keeps changing and new needs come about, and if we're doing our job well, then we'll have a chance to help them. And anything to add, uh, Wendy, when it comes to, you know, we're talking about technology and its role in holding people accountable, but then there's also its role within global health, within advocacy, and within social impact. I mean, how is technology figuring into some of the work that you're doing and some of the partnerships? It's figuring in very heavily, and it's been an incredibly constructive force. Yeah. Um, if we think about education mm -hmm. and the impact of some of the digital opportunities around to provide improved targeted education at much lower cost, um, the work that we're doing in leapfrogging healthcare right. is actually about how we can take some of the innovations that are happening in the developing world and actually transfer them back to the developed world. Because yes. what we're having to do in the developing world is innovate to do things at lower cost, right. but it's actually a better way of doing things. So the e-learning platforms for nurses, the task shifting that that allows, right. coming up with much better systems to actually implement healthcare in Africa than we have sometimes in the U.S. It's so interesting you say that. Uh, I was interviewing, I forget her name now, which is embarrassing, but I, you know we've met a lot of people here at yes. Davos, as you know, yes. it's tough. Yes. Well, I'll definitely look her up, but uh, and you can too, because mm -hmm. she was here. She's a young global shaper, and she had come up with this baby incubator. Uh, yeah. You know, you may know what I'm talking about. Yeah. That they're using in in African yeah. parts of the developing world, that you can uh, boil it, uh, mm -hmm. and it's w a wax substance, and then it oh. stays warm for a certain amount of time, and it can be used, and it can be reused yeah. and recycled. And she said that, you know, her next step is is figuring how she can bring that back. To yes. the developed world, even though, you know, I thought, oh my God, exactly. that's a brilliant idea. Yes. Why has no one thought of this? Yep. And so I know that's maybe a small example, but it seems to fit right but in with what you're saying. It's exactly the same thing. Right. And the, the good news is actually there are many, many examples. Right, right, exactly. So before I, I let you both go, yeah. you know, we can sit here and talk about uh, how to measure success and all of these things that we're discussing, but, but in your profession, I know you travel a lot. I know mm -hmm. that it's, uh, you know, you're off. Uh, uh, must be exhausted sometimes. How do you remedy that and how do you find time to kind of uh, make sure that you are taking care of yourself so that you can be effective and so that you can be effective in your leadership and in, in the work you do? I find really trying to get sleep makes a difference. Trying. And, uh, uh, try. No, no, well, that's, that's the truth. I mean, Ariana talks about getting seven to eight hours a night. I don't hit that goal. Yeah. But, on the, but if I let it get too bad, I find I'm just not sharp. And when I, go, I was in 35 countries last year, right? right? So I'm going around the world. And when right. I'm in that country, that's, I'm not there all, a bunch of times. I'm there once right. a year or twice. And they're long and, flights. And, they're, and I need, have a responsibility to be really not just present, but engaged. Mm -hmm. So you, you got to get some sleep. You've got to leave time for yourself. I find I've made a lot of trade-offs so that I can just focus on BCG and my mm -hmm. family. Right. And I've traded off a bunch of other things that I would love to do. Yeah. But you, know, you, you have to make some choices about where you focus. And, and that's the one I made in order to be able to do this. You said BCG and your family. I'm curious, you know, is that where you derive a sense of success? Is that what it means to you to be, I mean, what does it mean to you I, to be successful? I want to make a difference. I want to help the world, help our clients, and frankly, help our team. I and mean, we have these amazing people who join us. Right. And I really think in a company like ours where the talent is so amazing, my job is mainly an enablement job. Right. I have people who are energized and entrepreneurial and passionate. And then my job is to help them get resources, help them focus their energies, help bring teams together from right. around the world, and help make sure that we're doing everything we can to help them make a difference. And I, it's actually an incredibly energizing job. The logistics are not energizing. Of course. <laughs> but, but, but what I get to do when right. I visit our clients or be with our teams, it is honestly, it's a privilege. Wendy, how about you? What's your answer? I mean, where do you drive success? And, and yeah. do you sleep as much as Richard or less? <laughs> I, <laughs> I hope not I less. have the same aspirations. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we all do. I'm sure it's a little more than he does. But I think actually, when you have passion around what you're doing, right. and when you love what you're doing, and when you do feel like you're at least in a small way helping to make a difference, mm -hmm. it's actually pretty easy to stay energized, right? I know what you mean. And I do try to stay reasonably healthy. I've tried to actually walk at Davos instead yeah, of using rather the shuttle, shuttle bus. Right. So that helps a little bit. Yeah. And um, success for you means what? Yeah. What does that mean for you? Oh. Success. <laughs> Success for me see, means seeing those global malaria numbers coming down as really? opposed to continuing to rise that they were doing a decade ago. And that's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of partners around the world. But knowing that we're contributing to that means success for us. And honestly, I'll have to, I mean, so I'll say more than Wendy would say herself, <laughs> that we have, I think, 
900 to 1,000 people each year in BCG working on the social impact projects we do around the world. Wow. And, and Wendy's team and what they've done and how much it's brought pride to BCGers everywhere to make a difference in education or malaria or the World Wildlife or WWF. I mean, those things, it, it, um, it's part of what energizes the firm because you know you have all these skills and you make a difference for business every day. Right. And you can channel those same energies and really make a difference in the world. I think it does help provide a sense of purpose and they've just done a great job. And that's what we're all searching for, at least me, a sense of purpose and, and a sense, as you said, to feel as though we have an impact. Absolutely. in the things that we're passionate about. Richard, Wendy, thank you so much for being with us. Pleasure. Thank you. Much more uh, coming up here from our World Economic Forum uh, Broadcast Center here at Hapo Sai. Be sure to stay.